Welcome back to the next lecture. In this one, we're going to go over spirometry, which is a very commonly used test to measure lung function. And I wanted to dedicate a full lecture to this just because it is important that you understand this. Now, let's start with a quick review from your step one information about lung volumes. This will help you better understand the results of our spirometry. Now, keep in mind, this is all a step one review. If you need a deeper review and you, you're just not remembering this stuff, go back and check out your step one info. To begin with, we have the total lung capacity. Remember, this is the total volume of the lungs when they're maximally inflated. Total lung capacity is equal to vital capacity plus residual volume. Now, vital capacity, which I just mentioned, is the volume of air breathed out after the patient takes their deepest inhalation and maximum exhalation possible. Residual volume is the volume of air remaining in the lungs after a maximum exhalation. The inspiratory reserve volume is the amount of air inhaled from peak normal inspiratory volume to total lung capacity. Tidal volume is the amount of air that moves in and out of the lungs with each normal respiratory cycle. Functional residual capacity is the volume in the lungs at the end of a normal exhalation, meaning the end of an exhalation in a respiratory cycle where the patient isn't maximizing their inhalation or their exhalation. Now we can calculate inspiratory capacity by adding tidal volume and inspiratory reserve volume. The expiratory reserve volume is the maximum amount of air that can be exhaled from the end expiratory position. All right, so pretty simple stuff. Now that we've defined those terms as they relate to the respiratory cycle, there's two critical findings that are obtained uh, from spirometry. This is the forced vital capacity, FVC, and the forced expiratory volume in one second, which is FEV1. Now, FVC is the volume of air that can forcibly be exhaled after full inspiration, and FEV1 is the volume of air that can be forcibly exhaled in the first one second after full inspiration. So it's the first one second of the FVC. Now, this is all important because the FEV1 to FVC ratio is a very common way to differentiate between obstructive and restrictive lung disease. And you'll, of course, remember this from those step one charts and pulmonary information. Now, in obstructive diseases, you have a low FEV1 to FVC ratio because the FEV1 is reduced due to the increased airway resistance to expiratory flow. Now, on the other hand, in restrictive lung diseases, the FEV1 to FVC ratio is normal or even slightly increased because the FEV1 and FVC are both reduced proportionally. So remember, if you get a low FEV1 to FVC ratio, think obstructive lung disease. If you see a normal or slightly elevated FEV1 to FVC ratio, you're thinking restrictive lung disease. Now, we have entire lectures on asthma and COPD, but it's worth mentioning here again how spirometry can be used to differentiate between these two conditions. So a patient with suspected asthma or COPD will undergo spirometry testing, and the patient's FEV1 would be recorded before the administration of a bronchodilator. If FEV1 increases after the patient receives a bronchodilator, this represents reversibility and is consistent with the diagnosis of asthma. If, on the other hand, the patient has no change or a very small change in their FEV1 after we give them a bronchodilator, this is consistent with COPD. This is also a, rev a review from your step one info. Remember that a flow volume loop is a great way to view inspiratory and expiratory flow and visualize the difference between restrictive and obstructive lung diseases. So as you can see here, expiratory and inspiratory flow are plotted on the y-axis with expiration above the x-axis and inspiration below the x-axis, and the x-axis is a measure of volume in liters. So here, this loop represents one performance of a maximal forced expiration and inspiration. Now, while we already went over the value of the FEV1 to FEC ratio, a flow volume loop will provide additional utility by helping us localize the specific airway constriction. So that flow volume loop that we were just looking at is an example of a normal flow volume loop. The expiratory portion has a rapid rise to peak flow rate, then an almost completely linear fall in flow. The inspiratory curve is symmetrical and saddle shaped. So the flow volume loop in a lower airway obstruction would show expiratory portions of the loop with a concave upward shape. This is frequently described as being having a scooped out pattern. Restrictive lung diseases show a decrease in vital capacity, large expiratory flows, and a tall witch's hat appearance with a steep descending limb. Another useful test to help us distinguish between conditions is the diffusing capacity, also known as DLCO. Now, this is a measure of the transfer of gas from the alveoli to the pulmonary capillary blood. 
You won't need to know the nitty gritty details for the test, but it's helpful for me to just explain this briefly, and then it's more logical why certain disease states would have low, normal, or high diffusing capacity. So during the test, the patient will inhale a test gas mixture that's made up of air, an inert tracer gas, and a very small measured amount of CO. Hemoglobin has a greater affinity to carbon monoxide than oxygen, and since the inhaled amount of carbon monoxide is known, the exhaled carbon monoxide is subtracted, and that helps us determine the amount transferred during a given breath hold time. The tracer gas will be analyzed simultaneously with carbon monoxide to determine the distribution of the test gas mixture. In this way, the diffusion impairments can be identified. Now, as there are a few moving parts here, it's not only lung diseases that can alter the measured diffusing capacity. Anemia will give you a lower diffusing capacity as well because there are less red blood cells picking up the gas. And conversely, polycythemia would have a high or higher uh, measured diffusing capacity value. Now, even something like pulmonary hemorrhage would increase the measured diffusing capacity because of the presence of large amounts of hemoglobin for the carbon monoxide to bind to. So these conditions are artificially altering the diffusing capacity. Now, the pulmonary conditions with true diffusion issues are interstitial lung diseases and infiltrative lung diseases, where the lungs are fibrotic, where the lung parenchyma has been replaced and gas exchange is impaired. Also, remember, in emphysema, there's a decrease in the diffusing capacity because of a loss of alveolar membrane surface area. So just think of those hyperlucent lungs on x-ray. There's less alveolar surface area that results in less diffusion. Asthma, however, has intact capillary and alveolar structure, so you should expect to see normal diffusing capacity in asthma. Obese patients can have increased values for diffusion capacity, which is likely related to increased pulmonary blood volume. So it's best to think of diffusing capacity intuitively. If the lungs have been replaced with fibrotic tissue, granulomas, or alveolar surface area, it makes sense that it's going to be decreased, and that would give you a low diffusing capacity. All right, let's do a couple content review questions, see how much you picked up here. I'll put 20 seconds on the clock, figure this one out, and then come on back. Correct answer here is D. Next question, I'll put 20 seconds on the clock. If you need more time, hit that pause button and then come on back. Correct answer here is A, and we have one more. I'll put 20 seconds on the clock and then come on back. The correct answer here is B, C-O-P-D. All right, that is the end of this lecture. I will see you guys on the next one.